How many times have I told you about the oldest hot rodding trick in the book? You take the big engine from your biggest car and you put it in one of your smallest cars. However, up until this point, that was the bastion only of cool cars. However, this man, crazy though it may be, took it from a crossover and he put it in a smaller crossover. So today, we drive all 2.5 liters of it. And turbo. Don't forget the turbo. Motorman thinks you forgot about the 2.5 liter turbo engine that's in the CX-9. If you want to really understand the details of this engine, I've gone and explained it to you before. The, li the link right here, or, or over there, somewhere, he's going to put it. Back to the other story where I explained it in detail. But basically, this CX-9 engine is what we're putting in the CX-5 now, which is sort of obviously a good idea because it's really powerful. And uh, this, is, this is an unusually torquey engine. 310 foot-pounds of torque right down at 2,000 RPM. Uh, and then at high RPM, we tune it uh, to take advantage of premium fuel. If you want to bother putting that in, it'll make 250 horsepower. If you live somewhere where you can get 93, which I don't. Uh, if you're not using high RPM much, put 87 in it. It'll still make all the torque at low RPM and make about 227 at the top, which is usually what I end up doing because I'm cheap. You know that old saying, truth in advertising? I believe that applies to the number plates in British Columbia one of the most stunning places on this planet. You and I have been here before. We've shot a couple episodes, but that was in the summer. This is the first time you and I are doing this together in the winter, and we have absolutely hit the lottery. Last night coming out of YVR, the sky opened and woke up this morning to a complete winter wonderland, one in which Coleman gave us one hell of a car. Uh, this is a CX-5. He fitted it with snow tires even has uh, snowboards and skis for later and yes Coleman and I are going skiing after a shoot this but most importantly this one is fitted with a 2.5 turbo so we've got a nice hill here let's put our foot into it after all turbos what you want when you come to elevation like this and I would say we're gonna go straight up the hill but well there's no traction but please don't try this at home put our foot into it and the, the thing that slaps you across the face immediately is all of a sudden there's acceleration Remember back to the original first drive review episode of this generation of CX-5, I wasn't impressed with the acceleration, frankly, because there wasn't a lot of it. And then some of you that went out and actually bought this thing, you all kind of complained about the same thing, that it just it, it didn't match its rivals. And the big thing was it just didn't deliver power like those. Well, here, there's two things going on. Number one, it delivers power just like the CX-9 and the Mazda 6 2.5 turbo in that 310 pounds of torque comes in for a situation like this. And it's programmed real low, but then to focus on fuel economy, it drops off real quick. Where the Hyundai's, the Kia's, the Volkswagen's we've driven, they stay flat all the way up to like, what, five, almost 6,000 RPM in some of those cases. All right, so Motorman thinks that apparently we decided not to make the torque fall off at a high RPM because somehow that helps fuel economy. That's not what it's all about. What we did is we focused all of our energy on this engine on making it have a lot of torque at low RPM and having really good boost response, which doesn't necessarily show up in the numbers. Um, but what we're focusing on is making it so that when you step on the gas, it is direct and immediate and very satisfying to drive. Uh, to do that, we had to make some trade-offs. Uh, we had to make the engine bigger, for example, uh, a two and a half liter where most people are doing a two liter. But we have to fit it in the same amount of space uh, as a two liter that has to fit between the frame rails. Um, if we were focused on high RPM power, if this was a sports car, for example, uh, we would use a smaller displacement with more space between the cylinder bores so we can do some cooling between the bores because at high RPM and high output, you have a lot of cooling needs. At low RPM, we don't necessarily need that. So then we can use a bigger cylinder that has more exhaust energy that'll spool the turbo up more quickly. So right off idle, we can light that turbo up and just come up on boost uh, as soon as you step on the gas. And that's really where our focus is for this engine. So net net, it is noticeably different and noticeably better but the same 
issue that plagues the CX-9 and the Mazda 6 2.5 turbo in where they program the torque that makes its way here and really it's a kind of a double-edged sword in that you lose acceleration at higher speeds but you're gaining fuel economy so it's kind of like pick your poison. So I grew up in Seattle, so this is sort of my natural environment, sitting in random lawn chairs you find on the side of the road and enjoying the scenery. For some reason, this is where I'm gonna to sit to explain suspension tuning to you because this is where we are and I don't wanna get up. Um, there's four things we did. I probably shouldn't start out with a number because I'm not sure if it's gonna come out to four. There's a couple of things we did to the suspension uh, on the new CX-5 to sort of move forward in our never ending quest to make the car handle better and ride better. One thing we did is we changed the steering geometry a little bit. So normally uh, as the body rolls, uh, when the outside uh, suspension is compressed, it'll take a little, it'll tow out a little bit, which takes away a little bit of the steering you just put in. We're taking out some of that roll understeer, that's what we call that. We're taking some of that out so that it, it kind of keeps that steering angle, which makes the car feel a little bit more nimble and gives it a little more front grip. Um, we're really trying to make the car carve through a corner naturally where it has a ton of front grip and just wants to point in the same direction that you're trying to go. It really helps kind of align the car with what you're looking at, what you're trying to do, and it makes it, it just feels better going through a corner that way. So every time we launch a new car, I'm going to give that same explanation because we're doing that to all of our cars. Um, Another thing we did is we've reduced some of the friction in the suspension. Uh, we want the suspension to move easily when it goes over a bump, but we don't want to have to reduce the damping because if we put less damping in it, the car gets floaty and it doesn't handle as well. So less friction is a good way to move easily without us having to compromise the handling at all. Uh, and then the other thing we've done is we've put some uh, rebound springs in the shocks. And this is a trick to help control the body posture at high cornering Gs. So when you're cornering really hard, the outside suspension will compress down onto the bump stops. The bump stop's just a urethane foam spring with some damping to it. So we tune those to be part of the suspension. But as the outside uh, suspension rolls onto the bump stops, it stops compressing, but the body wants to keep rolling. So the inside starts lifting even more. Um, and you get this feeling that the car's kind of coming up off the ground and feels a little bit uh, less stable. So we put a, a spring inside of the shocks that's resisting the extension on the inside. And we set that spring to start coming into contact right at the same time that the outside suspension is hitting those bump stops. And we can use that con to control the body's posture in, in a corner. So as you hit the bump stops on the outside, you also hit the rebound springs on the inside and it holds the inside down you end up with less body roll a more composed feeling but you don't end up with the trade-offs you get from a big sway bar that's always trying to resist roll it's only resisting at high g and uh, uh when the roll is sort of getting excessive uh, so those little tweaks sort of just helped ex us expand the envelope make the car handle better when you want to be a hooligan like me and ride better when when you want to be civilized so there you go everybody wins When was the last time you and I discussed driving dynamics in a snowstorm? I believe it was Mount Hood in that Mini. So here's a couple of different things. Number one, I would argue a more capable all-wheel drive system and a much taller center of gravity. But here, we need to talk about driving dynamics as it relates to the changes here, because this is not the usual experience we're gonna have, because A, we have no traction, and B, we've got snow tires. So not exactly the normal out-of-the-box CX-5 turbo. But all those changes that, that Coleman just told you about, uh, you notice it on highways, you notice it at speed. There's more stability. I think I shared with you in the CX-5 first drive review a year and a half ago, that I felt it was a little softly sprung, uh, more so than the previous generation CX-5. Yeah, there's no traction here, but this kind of simulates broken pavement, it simulates rough roads, things like that. And I'm feeling stability here like I would in I don't know, even like a Macan, it's that close. Is it set up like that V6S Macan with 348 horsepower that we drove with Air Ride and PASM and stunning Majorca? No, it's close to that two liter four cylinder turbo that we drove, but without PASM and without Air Ride. So it's got more stability, more composure, but what the changes that Coleman made, I feel they control pit squat, drive and roll more so than the base car.
to me, this is all about the 2.5 turbo and no suspension changes. I would argue more so the suspension changes. However, there's changes you can't see, and that is something called a signature. If you're a Mazda fanboy or fangirl, you probably know what that means from a CX-9 and now that Mazda 6 2.5 turbo we drove, meaning a much fancier interior. Uh, this one, same theme. So it's got the Napa leather, uh, it's got the fancy headliner, uh, fancy rear view mirror, more toys like a heated steering wheel, that kind of stuff. And in, in general, the dress up is a bit better, like there's real wood over here. However, something falls down a little bit here. Like, I love the tactile feel of the inside of this car. Not just on the seats, seats, top of the door panels, top of the dash, the whole thing. But what's missing is the coloring. Like, I need contrast, man. Uh, this has got this stunning soul red paint, like other Mazdas have. However, that's a brown, believe it or not. That is indeed brown, but it's not, it's not rich like a saddle. Like, do you remember back in the 80s, Mercedes had that Palomino interior? That's kind of what this needs to really have that contrast with the soul red on the exterior. And then if we're going back to 80s uh, Mercedes culture, how about this being burled walnut? Because this is like a gray, it's real wood, but it's like a gray thing. That would really make all of the design details and the tactile feel they put into this thing, it would just stand out from a visual perspective, not just a tactile feel perspective. Uh, and then while we're talking about tactile feel, there's this whole controller down here. And it turns out this was the big reason for the delay of the installation or really uh, grafting on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. But you know what? Rather than me tell you about this, let's let Coleman tell you. The glance time from the road to here is very short. And the farther, farther forward we put it, the less time it takes you to refocus your eyes. But these uh, CarPlay and Android Auto systems are designed around being a touchscreen operated system. So we had to do a lot of work to make them work smoothly with our commander. Because ultimately, once you learn how to use it, there's a lot fewer steps and it's a lot easier to operate with this commander. So a couple of examples of how we can do that. Uh, things we've done that are sort of unique. We can switch between uh, systems really easily just by pressing and holding that, we switch back to the, the base system. I can be listening to uh, something in the, in, in the built-in audio system, the, the Sirius XM, for example, and still be navigating uh, on, my, uh, on my phone. So if I want to use a, a sort of a mixed environment where I'm in both systems, I can, I can do that. Look at that. It knows my flight. That's creepy. Another thing we w really wanted to make sure uh, is that when we introduced this in our new cars, Everybody who had bought a Mazda previously and had this uh, Mazda Connect system could also upgrade to this system. So we built hundreds of thousands of extra wiring harnesses and connectors to be able to, to sell this adapter kit. Unfortunately, we couldn't do a free upgrade because there's actually a different USB hub that we have to put in the car. But it's like a $200 wiring harness and USB hub that you stick in uh, your existing car upgrade the software and boom, suddenly you're now up to date with what everybody else has. So that took a surprisingly long amount of time because we had to make so many extra harnesses and there was some bottleneck where we could make the connector fast enough or something. I don't know. It was, it was confusing. Uh, but it's here now and it works really well and that's, that's the important part. I spent a lot of time in the flight back from YVR reflecting upon this 2.5 turbo application in the CX-5 and came to two distinct schools of thought. There's the parts that impact us broken car guys, and then there's the practical, the way to put the money. Let's start with the first. So I rolled into this when I got off the plane thinking it's all about the extra horsepower. But it turns out all those small suspension changes that Coleman made they amount to way more than the sum of their parts to the point that the suspension changes are really 51% of the overall difference of the 2.5 turbo package. And there's really no other way to put this. Remember when we first drove the CX-5, this current gen car? I was, I was fully certain that they, they spent too much time softening the car to make it appeal to more buyers, and now it is the best-selling Mazda here in the US, probably in other markets. But now, by giving it more power, again, which it absolutely needed, but tweaking the suspension, it now matches the perception that us broken car guys have in our head of how a Mazda should drive, and thus, it is 
it's like head and shoulders above everything else that it competes with. And that's when we have to segue into the practical. So I did some digging on the money, and it turns out the Grand Touring Reserve, which is the most basic one that uh, you can spec, the 2.5 turbo in, uh, the only option I could put on it was the sole red paint, which you gotta have. And it came to like 36 grand with the destination. Then there was the signature, which is the full tilt, the one we drove. Even with that, everything, again, sole red paint and destination was 38 grand. So I did some building. I went over to like the usual suspects of competitors, obviously, Toyota being the biggest. And it turns out at 34, 35 grand, the RAV4 has way less horsepower, even though it's comparably equipped, way less horsepower and certainly doesn't drive like the Mazda. So now it comes to, it's right on the money, not the same problem we had in the Mazda 6. It's not only a very aggressive competitor in terms of pricing now, it's much better to drive. And that's what the 2.5 turbo is all about. So I'm gonna turn this around to you guys and pose the question, is 34, 35 too much for this size, two row, with this much horsepower? Or is 38 too much with the super fancy? Like, is there a demand for you guys to buy something that has a heated steering wheel and Napa leather in this segment, or do you spend more money and get something with a fancy badge? Let me know in the comments below, or via our social media, Motoman TV on Word, Motoman TV on Word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And now I need to turn to logistics. So in a couple of days, we're gonna share our uh, Christmas episode, our annual adventure episode with you. And this one's gonna be very special. It's unlike anything we've done before. I, I brought my friend, my motorcycle friend, Jason Fogelson along with me. So it gives you kind of a hint of what we're doing, but not exactly what you think. That's gonna come up in a couple of days and that will close season nine. We're gonna take a hiatus and come back in early 2019 uh, with season 10, believe it or not. Huge thank you to joining us for all of this, what, 10 years. And with that, let's dispense with housekeeping and being practical because it finally arrived. Yes, that is exactly what you think she is. And she's magical. All 500 naturally aspirated horsepower going through six forward gears, three pedals, and manual seats. And oh, by the way, a sound that will absolutely piss off your neighbors. So Kumo and I are gonna spend some quality time together before we go see the family up in Oregon. But this is coming to you in season 10. Oh, by the way, as well as the new 992. Until I see you next time, be später. So I just parked the CX-5, lost the jacket I brought all the way from California. Genius. But we really did have a reason to put the skis and the snowboard on the top of that CX-5 turbo. Right. Because we really aren't going skiing, aren't we? Those weren't your skis or snowboard, though. Well, I rented these. Yeah, right. So I think we can ski. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, we're skiing. See you guys later.